Please welcome the chairman of the George W. Bush Foundation Board of Directors, Donald L. Evans. Good morning and welcome to the George W. Bush Presidential Center and to the beautiful campus of Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. I'm proud to be here with all of you today as we dedicate this beautiful building to the American people. Two years ago, we broke ground on this site and the hard work of many people is realized in the building behind me today. Of course, no one has done more to make this place possible than President George W. Bush and Mrs. Laura Bush. I've had the honor of calling them my friends for more than 40 years. And I've been privileged to witness firsthand the steady resolve and principled leadership of President Bush. Those who come here will learn about that leadership and about a consequential time in American history. Researchers and scholars will study the presidential records housed in the archives. Students and museum visitors will learn about the modern American presidency, the first decade of the 21st century, and the story of George and Laura Bush. On the other side of this building is the George W. Bush Institute. Here, thinkers and doers are working to advance freedom and defend the principles that guided President and Mrs. Bush throughout their lives and through their service to Texas, America, and the world. Today is a day to celebrate President and Mrs. Bush for their commitment to this country, to honor the American presidency, and to look forward to the impact this most important civic institution will leave on the lives of people in our country and around the world. We are honored that you have joined us today. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, the 46th Vice President of the United States, Richard B. Cheney. Mrs. Lucy B. Johnson. Mrs. Linda J. Robb. Mrs. Tricia Nixon Cox. Mrs. Susan Ford Bales. Mr. Michael Reagan.
Ladies and gentlemen, the First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Michelle Obama, Mrs. Laura Bush, Mrs. Hillary Rodham Clinton, Mrs. Barbara Bush, Mrs. Rosalind Carter. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Barack Obama, President George W. Bush, President Bill Clinton, President George H. W. Bush, President Jimmy Carter. Please remain standing for the invocation by the Reverend Mark Craig, followed by the presentation of colors. Thank you. Let us pray. We have gathered here today, O oh God, to offer thanks for the life and the legacy of President and Mrs. George W. Bush. We thank you for their distinguished leadership to our nation. Moreover, we are grateful for their moral courage and commitment to public service. O oh God, our Lord, creator and sustainer, today we honor a man who genuinely believes in your quest of freedom for all. We ask that President Bush and his family continue to feel the prayers and support of people all over the world who recognize his past and continued work for the expansion of freedom. We ask your blessings upon the George W. Bush Presidential Center and all who will walk through these doors. We pray that it will serve as a beacon of hope and freedom throughout the world. We pray that it will remind each and every one of us of our nation's heroic past and generate noble insights for future leaders of our country. Grant that each of us today will rededicate our lives to the values of this great institution. As we continue to learn the lessons of history, help us to live out the words of the prophet Micah, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. We pray all these things in thy name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Pledge of Allegiance, led by First Lieutenant Melissa Stockwell, United States Army. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the chair of the George W. Bush Institute Advisory Board, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Good morning, Mr. President and Mrs. Obama, President and Mrs. Carter, President and Mrs. George H.W. Bush, President and Mrs. Clinton, and President and Mrs. Bush. I have the honor of introducing a number of global leaders, national leaders, and Texas state leaders who've come to join us on this momentous occasion. As your name is called, may I ask you to stand and may I ask the audience to hold your applause so that we can acknowledge our global leaders together. President of the Republic of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili and Mrs. Sandra E. Roloffs. Former President of Spain, President Athnar. The former President of Ghana, John Kufour. The former President of South Korea, Lee Myung Bok and Mrs. Yoon Ong Kim. Former President and Mrs. Lourdes Maria Rodriguez de Flores of El Salvador. Former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi of Italy. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair and Mrs. Cherie Blair of the United Kingdom. Former, President, uh, former Prime Minister and Mrs. John Howard of Australia. Former Prime Minister and Mrs. Ehud Olmert of Israel. Former Secretary General, current Secretary General of NATO, Mr. Fogg Rasmussen. His Royal Highness, Bandar bin Sultan of Saudi Arabia. Abdul Al Khalifa of Bahrain. Former Ambassador to the United States, Am Ambassador Ronan Sen of India. Current Ambassadors to the United States, Ambassador Salim Al Sabah of Kuwait, Ambassador Dino Pati Jal of Indonesia, Ambassador Akhil Hamid Hakimi and Mrs. Hakimi of Afghanistan, Ambassador Tabaliso Sreste of Botswana, the German Chief of Mission, Mr. Jans Hanafel. Please join me in acknowledging and welcoming our global leaders. I would now like to acknowledge the Governor of Texas, Rick Perry. The Governor of Arizona, Jan Brewer. The Governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie and Mrs. Mary Pat Christie. The former Governor of Alabama, Bob Riley. And the former Governor of Michigan, John Engler and his wife, Michelle. I want to greet the following members of Congress. Senator Ted Cruz and his wife, Heidi, of Texas. Senator John Cornyn of Texas. Senator, former Senator Bill Frist. Former Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson. The Speaker of the House, Congressman John Boehner and his wife, Debbie. Congressman Jeb Hensarling. 
Congresswoman Kay Granger, Congressman Michael Burgess, Congressman Pete Sessions, Congressman Mike Conaway, Congressman Kenny Marchant, Congressman John Micah. And now of the Texas elected representatives, Lieutenant Governor David Dewhurst, Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives, Joe Strauss, the Mayor of Dallas, Michael Rawlings, the Mayor of Highland Park, Joel Williams, the Mayor of University Park, Richard Davis, and the former Mayor of Dallas, Tom Leppard. I want to thank you for being here for this wonderful occasion, and I would like those in the audience to once again acknowledge the presence of our global, national, and local leaders. Thank you very much. Please welcome the chairman of the George W. Bush Foundation Board of Directors, Donald L. Evans, accompanied by the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. I'm pleased to be joined by the Honorable David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States. On behalf of the George W. Bush Foundation, it is my honor to present to you and to the American people, the key to the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. There you go, sir. Yeah. You just want to go. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Laura Bush. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to all of our friends and family who've joined us today. Be seated. Welcome to all of our friends and family who've joined us today from around the country and around the world. Thank you all for coming. And a special welcome to President Obama and Michelle, to President Clinton and Secretary Clinton, 
to President Carter and Rosalind. And finally, we're thrilled to have our father and mother, President George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush. I know for the presidential families that nothing says an exciting get-together more than an invitation to come and see millions of documents from someone else's time in office. <laughs> so thank you all very much for coming. A warm welcome to the former heads of state who have joined us, the diplomatic corps, the members of the United States Congress, and our armed forces. And we're especially happy to see the familiar faces of so many of the Bush-Cheney administration. In the United States, the presidency is not just about one person. The presidency is about all of the people that join with that president in years of service to our remarkable nation. They're the people who never fly on Air Force One, but who put in countless late nights and earlier mornings who spend less time with their family and friends, and more time hard at work caring for our country. The presidency is about the men and women of our military, who serve every president, and who make the ultimate sacrifice to protect us and keep us safe. The stones in the walls behind us represent your years of service. This building is here because of your service, and for that, George and I thank you from the bottom of our hearts. <clears throat> A presidential library is not just about one president. Each library is about our nation and the world during that time. The George W. Bush Presidential Center reflects George's role as the first president of the 21st century. Like our new era, the building and its grounds are designed to be forward-looking, and they're green and sustainable. They celebrate the native environment of our home state of Texas. The archives housed here are completely digital, and the entire Bush Center is designed to present the past and engage the future. We welcome scholars and students and the community at large to gather here for generations to come. The center is designed to be human in scale because like the White House, presidential libraries belong to all Americans. The people across our nation were the ones who inspired us every day. Here we remember the heartbreak and the heroism of September 11th and the bravery of those who answered the call to defend our country. We remember the volunteers of all ages and all walks of life who came to the Gulf Coast following Hurricane Katrina. And we remember all the people who stepped forward to help others, whether to teach a child to read or to feed a hungry family. And throughout this center, I'm reminded of my husband. I remember the image of George standing amid the rubble of the World Trade Center his arm around the shoulders of a retired firefighter who had grabbed his old gear to go search for the missing. I remember George standing alone on the pitcher's mound at Yankee Stadium, preparing to throw out the first pitch in New York of the 2001 World Series during that long season of heartbreak and healing. I remember his quiet visits with the families of the fallen sharing their stories and their tears. And I remember how steadfast and steady he was for eight years. Since we've been home, I've added new memories. I see George lifting a brush to paint and refurbish a health clinic in the African nation of Zambia. I see George last May on a bike ride with wounded veterans when he hopped off his own bike to help push an army major who was pedaling with only one leg up the steep hills. My George is a man who, when someone needs a hand, offers him their arms. This is the spirit I hope is forever captured in this beautiful building, that this will always be a place 
that welcomes each visitor with open arms. Thank you all and welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, President Jimmy Carter. Well, it's a great honor for me to be here today, and it reminds me of uh, my favorite cartoon in the New Yorker magazine. This little boy is looking up at his father, and he says, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be a former president. Well, four of us have already made that goal, and one is still working on it, but it is a wonderful thing to be with the other presidents and to have a chance to address this wonderful audience. I'll be very brief, and I'll be limiting my comments just to the things that I know personally that have been important for me and for George W. Bush. In uh, 2000, as some of you may remember, there was a disputed election for several weeks, and finally, when uh, 
President Bush became president, they had the inauguration in Washington on schedule. And I think my wife and I were the only two volunteer Democrats on the platform. And George and Laura afterwards came up and thanked us for coming. And so I, he said, now, if there's anything I can ever do for you, let me know, which was a mistake he made. <laughs> and I said, Mr. President, the Carter Center has programs in 35 countries in the world, and the worst problem now is a war going on between North and South Sudan. And millions of people have been killed, and I'd like for you to help us have a peace agreement there. And in a weak moment, he said, I'll do it. And I said, when can I meet your Secretary of State and your National Security Advisor? He said, well, I haven't even chosen them yet, but give us three weeks. So three weeks later, I came up and met with Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, and President Bush kept his promise. He appointed a distinguished senator from Missouri, John Danforth, and a great general from Kenya named Sumbewo. And on the first, in January of 2005, there was a peace treaty between North and South Sudan that ended a war that had been gone for 21 years. George W. Bush is responsible for that. And that was the first of his great contributions to the countries in Africa. As has already been mentioned briefly here, he increased the development assistance to Africa from the time he went in office until he left from $1.4 billion to more than $9 billion. And that's an increase of 640 percent. That is development assistance. He established a PEPFAR program. There were 50,000 HIV sufferers in Africa being treated when he came in office. When he left office per year, 2 million. I'll let you figure the percentage on that. And now at this new institute, he has a program called Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, and he says to save women from cervical and breast cancer in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's, again, is something that's dear to my heart and I know means a lot to millions of people in Africa. So, Mr. President, let me say that I'm filled with admiration for you and deep gratitude for you about the great contributions you've made to the most needy people on Earth. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, President George H.W. Bush. Right there. It's on there. Right, 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 hold on a second. Hold on for a minute. What a boss is yours. Thank you all very much. What a beautiful day in Dallas. It's a great pleasure to be here. And they honor our son, our oldest son. And this is very special for Barbara and me. And thank you all for coming. And to all those who made this marvelous museum possible, we thank you especially. And we're glad to be here. God bless America, and thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, President Bill Clinton. Thank you very much, President and Mrs. Bush, and President and Mrs. Obama, President and Mrs. Carter, all the representatives here of the other previous presidents, the Ford, Nixon, Johnson families. I told President Obama that this was the latest, grandest example 
of the eternal struggle of former presidents to rewrite history. <laughs> and I want to take my hat off to President Bush. This is a beautiful library. The exhibits are great. The work of the Bush Institute is inspiring. And I congratulate him on the Platinum Leeds rating for his library. I think this is the second building in the entire federal system that has it. And I want to say, Mr. President, once again, you got the better of me twice in the last few weeks. My library has a Platinum Leeds rating, but it was open for a few years before we could afford to achieve it. And you beat me to be a grandfather. <laughs> And I congratulate you and Laura for it. I, um, you know, starting with my work with uh, President George H.W. Bush on the tsunami and the aftermath of Katrina, people began to joke that I was getting so close to the Bush family, I had become the black sheep son. My mother told me not to talk too long today. <laughs> and Barbara, I will not let you down. <laughs> there is one other connection I have that I think is largely unknown, which is that a couple of times a year in his second term, George Bush would call me just to talk politics. And a chill went up and down my spine when Laura said that all their records were digitized. <laughs> Dear God, I hope there's no record of those conversations in this vast and beautiful building. I want to say, as President Carter did, I, I was impressed that President Bush invites us to make different decisions if we choose on the decisions he was facing. It's one of the most interesting things about this library. I want to talk about a couple of other things that are beyond controversy. First, I want to thank President Bush for passing PEPFAR. No president of my party could have passed that through the Congress. And I worked all over Africa with our Health Access Initiative and AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, building health systems. I have personally seen the faces of some of the millions of people who are alive today because of it. And I want to thank President Obama for continuing it and increasing it. I want to thank you and Laura for continuing your work in global health. I want to thank you for your efforts when president to reform our immigration system and keep America a nation of immigrants. And I hope the Congress will follow President Obama's efforts to follow the example you set. And I thank you for that. And I want to thank you for the work we did together in the aftermath of Haiti, the poorest country in our hemisphere. We have closed our fund. I, I believe in working yourself out of a job. But we helped a lot of people start businesses which are now thriving, and we gave the country the first home mortgage system it ever had. So I thank you for that, Mr. President. I, uh, I can't, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. Your mother showed me some of your landscapes and animal paintings, and I thought they were great really great. And I seriously considered calling you and asking you to do a portrait of me <laughs> until I saw the results of your sister's hacked emails. Those bathroom sketches were wonderful, but at my age, I think I should keep my suit. I like President Bush. Even, we do a lot of speeches together, and I like it when we have disagreements. He's disarmingly direct. We were having an argument over health care in one of these speeches, and I went on about the 
German healthcare system. He said, I don't know a thing about the German healthcare system. I think he probably won the argument. We are here to celebrate a country we all love, a service we all rendered. And debate and difference is an important part of every free society by asking us to join him in the decisions he made and inviting us to make different ones if we choose, he has honored that deepest American tradition. For all of these things, as an American citizen, I am very grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. To President Mrs. Bush, to President Clinton, and now former Secretary Clinton, to President George H.W. Bush and Mrs. Bush, to President and Mrs. Carter, to current and former world leaders, and all the distinguished guests here today, uh, Michelle and I are honored to be with you to mark this historic occasion. Uh, this is a uh, Texas-sized party, and that's worthy of what we're here to do today, honor the life and legacy of the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. When all the living former presidents are together, it's also a special day for our democracy. We've been called the world's most exclusive club, and we do have a pretty nice clubhouse. But the truth is, uh, our club's more like a support group. The last time we all got together was just before I took office, and I needed that because, as each of these leaders will tell you, no matter how much you may think you're ready to assume the office of the presidency, it's impossible to truly understand the nature of the job until it's yours, until you're sitting at that desk. And that's why every president gains a greater appreciation for all of those who served before them, for the leaders from both parties who've taken on the momentous challenges and felt the enormous weight of a nation on their shoulders. And for me, that appreciation very much extends to President Bush. Now, the first thing I found in that desk the day I took office was a letter from George, and one that demonstrated his compassion and his generosity. For he knew that I would come to learn what he had learned, that being president above all is a humbling job. There are moments where you make mistakes. There are times where you wish you could turn back the clock. And what I know is true about President Bush, and I hope my successor will say about me, is that we love this country and we do our best. Now, in the past, President Bush has said it's impossible to pass judgment on his presidency while he's still alive, so maybe this is a little bit premature. But even now, there are certain things that we know for certain. We know about the son who was raised by two strong, loving parents in Midland, famous, famously inheriting, as he says, my daddy's eyes and my mother's mouth. The young boy who once came home after a trip to a museum and proudly presented his horrified mother with a small dinosaur tailbone he had smuggled home in his pocket. <laughs> I'll bet that went over great with Barbara. We know about the young man who met the love of his life at a dinner party, ditching his plans to go to bed early and instead talking with the brilliant and charming Laura Welsh late into the night. We know about the father who raised two remarkable, caring, beautiful daughters, uh, even after they tried to discourage him from running for president, saying, Dad, you're not as cool as you think you are. <laughs> Mr. President, I can relate. <laughs> and now we see President Bush, the grandfather, just uh, beginning 
to spoil his brand new granddaughter. So we know President Bush the man, and what President Clinton said is absolutely true. To know the man is to like the man, because he's comfortable in his own skin. He knows who he is. He doesn't put on any pretenses. He takes his job seriously, but he doesn't take himself too seriously. He is a good man. But we also know something about George Bush, the leader. As we walk through this library, obviously, we're reminded of the incredible strength and resolve that came through that bullhorn as he stood amid the rubble and the ruins of Ground Zero, promising to deliver justice to those who had sought to destroy our way of life. We remember the compassion that he showed by leading the global fight against HIV-AIDS and malaria, helping to save millions of lives and reminding people in some of the poorest corners of the globe that America cares and that we're here to help. We remember his commitment to reaching across the aisle to unlikely allies like Ted Kennedy because he believed that we had to reform our schools in ways that help every child learn, not just some. That we have to repair a broken immigration system. And that this progress is only possible when we do it together. You know, seven years ago, President Bush restarted an important conversation by speaking with the American people about our history as a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. And even though comprehensive immigration reform has taken a little longer than any of us expected. I am hopeful that this year, with the help of Speaker Boehner and some of the senators and members of Congress who are here today, that we bring it home for our families and our economy and our security and for this incredible country that we love. And if we do that, it will be in large part thanks to the hard work of President George W. Bush. And finally, a president bears no greater decision and no more solemn burden than serving as commander-in-chief of the greatest military that the world has ever known. As President Bush himself has said, America must and will keep its word to the men and women who have given us so much. So even as we Americans may at times disagree on matters of foreign policy, we share a profound respect and reverence for the men and women of our military and their families, and we are united in our determination to comfort the families of the fallen and to care for those who wear the uniform of the United States. On the flight back from Russia, after negotiating with Nikita Khrushchev at the height of the Cold War, President Kennedy's secretary found a small slip of paper on which the President had written a favorite saying. I know there is a God, and I see a storm coming. If he has a place for me, I believe I am ready. No one can be completely ready for this office, but America needs leaders who are willing to face the storm head on even as they pray for God's strength and wisdom so that they can do what they believe is right. And that's what the leaders with whom I share this stage have all done. That's what President George W. Bush chose to do. That's why I'm honored to be part of today's celebration. Mr. President, for your service, for your courage, for your sense of humor, and most of all, for your love of country, Thank you very much. From all the citizens of the United States of America, God bless you, and God bless these United States.
I believe one develops a set of principles through a faith, a how you were raised, and where you're raised. I had a set of principles that I had developed throughout my life. And by the time I became president, uh, I was willing to defend those principles. I wanted to make sure that the economy was strong. We needed to bolster our military in order to maintain the peace. It was important to promote a culture in which each individual is responsible for his or her decisions. We could improve our public school system so that people had a chance at the American dream, that free enterprise system needed to be defended, and that we could achieve a more peaceful world through a strong America. I, I never wanted to be a wartime president, but war came to our shores. On 9-11, I had a lot of emotions. Mostly, I was determined. I was determined to protect America. Any commander-in-chief ought to develop a special bond with the military, and I certainly did so. Because the toughest decision a president makes is to send men and women in harm's way. And I thought of a multitude of issues that I was interested in, and of course, one of them is literacy. After September 11th, uh, many other uh, options for issues uh, confronted me, and one of them was women's rights. So when I made the presidential radio address uh, talking about the brutal treatment of women and children by the Taliban, um, I started getting responses from women everywhere across our country. One of the guiding principles of my presidency was to whom much is given, much is required. And America is such a blessed nation that I believe we have an obligation to help uh, human suffering where we possibly can. Life is service till the end. Ladies and gentlemen, President George W. Bush. Thank you all. Please be seated. Oh, happy days. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Laura and I are thrilled to have so many friends, I mean a lot of friends, here to celebrate this special day. Uh, there was a time in my life when I wasn't likely to be found at a library, much less found one. <laughs> Beautiful building has my name above the door, but it belongs uh, to you. It honors the cause we serve and the country we share. For eight years, you gave me the honor of serving as your president, and today I'm proud to dedicate this center to the American people. I am very grateful to President Obama and Michelle for making this trip. Unlike the other presidents here, he's actually got a job. President, thank you for your kind words and for leading the nation we all love. I appreciate my fellow members of the former President's Club, 42, 41, and 39. I want to thank you all for your kind words and the example you have set. Alexander Hamilton once worried about ex-presidents wandering among the people like discontented ghosts. <laughs> Actually, I think we seem pretty happy. One reason is that we have wonderful first ladies at our side. <laughs> Hillary and Rosalind, thank you for your service and your generosity. Mother and Laura, you know how I feel. <laughs> Connie introduced the world leaders with whom I had the privilege to serve. You're good friends, and I'm honored to have you here in the promised land. I want to welcome the members of Congress. Mr. Speaker, appreciate you coming. And the diplomatic corps, I know you will all be happy to hear that this speech is a lot shorter than the State of the Union. I thank the governors, governor of our own home state, and other governors, mayors, state and local officials who joined us. I welcome members of my cabinet, 
the White House staff and administration, especially Vice President Dick Cheney. From the day I asked Dick to run with me, he served with loyalty, principle, and strength. Proud to call you friend. <laughs> History is going to show that I served with great people, a talented, dedicated, intelligent men, a team of men and women who love our nation as much as I do. I want to thank the people who have made this project a success. President Gerald Turner runs a fantastic university. A university with active trustees, dedicated faculty, and a student body that is awesome. I want to thank David Ferriero, Alan Lowe, and the professionals at the National Archives and Records Administration who have taken on a major task, and I am confident you all will handle it. I appreciate the architects, landscapers, and designers, especially Bob Stern, Michael Van Valkenburg, and Dan Murphy. I want to thank the folks of Manhattan Construction, as well as all the workers who built a fine facility that will stand the test of time. I thank the fantastic team of the George W. Bush Center, headed by Mark Langdale and Jim Glassman, and my longtime pal, Donnie Evans. Much to the delight, much to the delight of the folks who worked on this project, we have raised enough money to pay our bills. We have, we have over 300,000 contributors from all 50 states, and Laura and I thank you from the bottom of our hearts. This is the first time in American history that parents have seen their son's presidential library. Mother, I promise to keep my area clean. <laughs> you know, Barbara Bush taught me to live life to the fullest, to laugh a lot, and to speak my mind, a trait that sometimes got us both into trouble. <laughs> Dad taught me how to be a president. Before that, he showed me how to be a man. And 41, it is awesome that you are here today. I welcome, I welcome my dear brothers and sister, as well as in-laws, cousins, nephews, nieces, uncles, all of you for joining us. Our family has meant more to me than anything, and I thank you for making it so. Not so long ago, this campus was home to a beautiful West Texan named Laura Welch. When she earned her degree in library science, I'm not sure this day is exactly what she had in mind. <laughs> She's been a source of strength and support and inspiration ever since we met in the O'Neill's backyard in Midland, Texas. One of the joys of the presidency was watching Laura serve as first lady. The American people rightly love her, and so do I. <laughs> Laura's going to be even better at her next role, grandmother. It was a joy. I can't tell you what a joy it was to hold little Mila. And I am really happy that Mila's mother and father, Jenna and Henry, could make it here today. Thank you all for coming. So if you don't have anything to do in the morning, tune in to the Today Show. <laughs> Jenna's a correspondent, thereby continuing the warm relations the Bush family has with the national press. <laughs> and I'm really proud of Barbara, who's with us, for her incredible work to serve others and to save lives. <laughs> Today marks a major milestone in a journey that began 20 years ago, when I announced my campaign for governor of Texas. Some of you were there that day. I mean, a lot of you were there that day. 
I picture you looking a little younger. You probably picture me with a little less gray hair. In politics, you learn who your real friends are. And our friends have stood with us every step of the way. And today's a day to give you a proper thanks. In democracy, the purpose of public office is not to fulfill personal ambition. Elected officials must serve a cause greater than themselves. The political winds blow left and right, polls rise and fall, supporters come and go. But in the end, leaders are defined by the convictions they hold. And my deepest conviction, the guiding principle of the administration, is that the United States of America must strive to expand the reach of freedom. I believe that freedom is a gift from God and the hope of every human heart. Freedom inspired our founders and preserved our union through civil war and secured the promise of civil rights. Freedom sustains dissidents bound by chains, believers huddled in underground churches, and voters who risk their lives to cast their ballots. Freedom unleashes creativity rewards innovation and replaces poverty with prosperity. And ultimately, freedom lights the path to peace. Freedom brings responsibility. Independence from the state does not mean isolation from each other. A free society thrives when neighbors help neighbors, and the strong protect the weak, and public policies promote private compassion. As president, I tried to act on these principles every day. It wasn't always easy, and it certainly wasn't always popular. One of the benefits of freedom is that people can disagree. It's fair to say I created plenty of opportunities to exercise that right. <laughs> but when future generations come to this library and study this administration, they're going to find out that we stayed true to our convictions. that we expanded freedom at home by raising standards in schools and lowering taxes for everybody, that we liberated nations from dictatorship and freed people from AIDS, and that when our freedom came under attack, we made the tough decisions required to keep the American people safe. Those same principles define the mission of the Presidential Center. I'm retired from politics, happily so, I might add, but not from public service. We'll use our influence to help more children start life with a quality education, to help more Americans find jobs and economic opportunity, to help more countries overcome poverty and disease, to help more people in every part of the world live in freedom. We'll work to empower women around the world to transform their countries stand behind the courageous men and women who have stepped forward to wear the uniform of the United States to defend our flag and our freedoms here at home. Ultimately, the success of a nation depends on the character of its citizens. As President, I had the privilege to see that character up close. I saw it in the first responders who charged up the stairs into the flames to save people's lives from burning towers. I saw it in the Virginia Tech professor who barricaded his classroom door with his body until his students escaped to safety. I saw it in the people of New Orleans who made homemade boats to rescue their neighbors from the floods. I saw it in the service members who laid down their lives to keep our country safe and to make other nations free. Franklin Roosevelt once described the dedication of a library as an act of faith. I dedicate this library with an un unshakable faith in the future of our country. It is the honor of a lifetime to lead a country as brave and as noble as the United States. Whatever challenges come before us, I will always believe our nation's best days lie ahead. God bless. <laughs>
Please stand for the national anthem, benediction, and the retirement of colors. Captain Stanley W. Fournier, United States Navy, will deliver the benediction. May we pray together. Gracious God, Today we acknowledge you work in the affairs of humankind and nations. Our prayer is that we as a people will listen carefully, respond appropriately, and live each day acutely aware of the need for your guidance. You grace us with men and women who lead, prompted by the power of personal conviction to help shape our national conscience and provide examples of extraordinary leadership. Today we gather to celebrate a marvelous occasion, establishing in this physical place a living reflection on our national history. President Bush and this presidential library establish his legacy, not only of stone and mortar, but of heart and soul, and serve as reminders that there are words that resonate in our national consciousness, words like justice, freedom, liberty, opportunity, sacrifice, ideals not merely of our own making, but of your creation, as you implant in each of your children these intrinsic values. Grant this day that the George W. Bush Presidential Center will forever help inform our national dialogue for good and will always remind us that our nation and world's best hope for an incurably optimistic future requires nothing less than our very best human effort, yet ultimately rest in your providential care. We acknowledge that this spirit of freedom and opportunity we celebrate today is often in need of vigilant care. So we remember those who have made the ultimate sacrifice and those who this very hour stand in harm's way, that you would assure them of your presence, our prayers, and the anticipation of a lasting peace. Now we give thanks for all those present today who have in the past provided faithful national stewardship and grant to our leaders today, especially President Obama, the gifts of wisdom, strength, and the encouragement of your care. Endow President Bush, Mrs. Bush, and their entire family with your blessings and our eternal goodwill. And may you bless our nation and all of your creation. Amen.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. This concludes our program.